Speaking of airline seats, so if you're on Southwest Airlines, I'm one of those double A level players. I get on first, right? So if I sit on the aisle seat, that middle seat's the last one to fill up. So let's talk about who's genetically diverse. <laughs> Just saying, there, there, there are advantages. So welcome. Um, the next section that we're gonna talk about here is what's uh, actually under embargo until Thursday at uh, 10 a.m. Um, so I'm Senior Director of Product Management. I'm, I'm the product guy for Spectra. Um, so we've been working on this for quite some time and if you, we're, we're gonna go back uh, to look at really what Matt's last slide was. What do we need as an industry going forward? And uh, the next set of things we're gonna talk about are really um, the Spectra products that fill those needs. And I, I'm very excited. This, you know, there's lots of press conferences out there where uh, they'll ask you to all come and show up and you know, they'll go, hey, <laughs> real revolution. You got 0.2 inch bigger screen and a one megapixel more selfie camera, that sort of thing. Um, we're gonna really talk about a revolution in storage technology and something really different for Spectra and I think really different for the industry as well. We've been working on this for quite some time. Um, this really is the culmination of really what we started two years ago with the last Spectra Summit, with the Black Pearl announcement. And you'll see how uh, what we're really talking about here now is a storage ecosystem. We're moving into the area where uh, the conversations we have as a storage vendor with customers are, yes, yes, we always talk about uh, tape and how much uh, data will fit on tape and how the robots work, but the, most of the conversations we're having now are about workflows. Um, what does your data look like? Uh, you know, what resolution and format of video uh, are you processing? How do you ingest it? What kind of software do you currently use? And are there ways with this new ecosystem that we have to save you money, to simplify the workflow, and to give you something that you've really never had before, a, a level of storage that really isn't currently available. So we're very excited about, uh, about where we're headed. We've got a lot to talk about really in this next hour. So I'm gonna go fast, but there's a lot of one-on-ones coming and we've got a hands-on lab this afternoon. We can go into a lot more detail. And uh, they very kindly passed out these little mints for us that are doing the one-on-ones. So the universal sign for you need a mint is you know, something like this. So just be prepared to give us a little feedback. Um, so let's go through uh, where we are as a company. So Spectra, as you know, we've been in the tape business and the digital storage business for now 36 years. Um, started actually in a dorm room not too, f uh, too far from here. And today we're actually going to talk about two or three new things. And I'm giving you just a little hint. You, if, if you haven't heard the name floating around yet, you, you probably will uh, within the next half hour. But we're going to talk about some, some new pieces to the ecosystem. We've been investing heavily in R&D to get to this point. And in fact, what we're doing today, as I said, is uh, I'm, I'm very proud because this is a, a two-year investment just since uh, Black Pearl and Black Pearl previous to that was another two years. So this is a big investment for us. So let's jump in. Let's start with uh, kind of a baseline of uh, where this technology comes from and the value of it. As everyone knows, cloud computing is the thing to talk about. There are lots of values in the cloud. There's lots of pieces to the cloud, software as a service, storage as a service, as you know, things like the S3 infrastructure, the Glacier infrastructure, Google's got their own, Swift Stack has their own, um, Hadoop. There are, there are many different places to store data in the cloud. There's lots of values to that cloud, and uh, I've spoken to a few of you, and there's some absolute experts uh, in this particular field in this room, so I would also encourage you to interact because there's a lot of value in understanding you know, those people that are really focused on cloud infrastructure and the, where this is headed in the short term. But if we boil it all down, what are all the benefits from our point of view, from a storage point of view? It really comes down to simplicity, scalability, and accessibility. And so the, the key question then is, how do we replicate that in our products, in Spectra products, and what can we do to really make that valuable? So this is actually a screenshot from uh, Amazon Web Services. If you haven't logged into this recently, it's probably already old. I, I, I took this a few days ago. It seems like they add a new service just every uh, few weeks. There's something amazing that goes up there. It's intimidating, it's daunting, trying to figure out what all the pieces do. You know, you really have to find expertise to understand those. But there, there is a really key point here that I, I think a lot of people miss. 
very frequently we focus on companies like Amazon and uh, Google and, and you know the rest and how, how are they doing in search and what advances are they making in social media this this screen represents a, a huge thing for our very society the fact that these tools are available online now means if I'm starting a new company I no longer have to invest you know critical uh, infrastructure into developing those core things. You need a database, you go use the database. Why would I you know, spend 10 engineers for a year to develop what I need? The fact that these tools are available is advancing society faster than it ever has before from a technology standpoint. So I, I would credit Amazon with uh, an ability to push forward technology faster now um, than we really ever have in, in, in the past. The cloud technologies are growing. They're incredible. The core question though is, well, if it's really uh, all that, why do we even have computers anymore? And I spoke to one of the guys at Ovation last night. Uh, well, it may not be long until we get to some uh, pretty dumb clients and everything is in the cloud. But today, there's clearly a need for, for infrastructure on the table in front of you as well. So then the question is, well, from a storage perspective, um, where does cloud fit? And uh, from our point of view of the world, there's small data and there's big data. If I'm, if I'm a small company or I'm a company with a relatively small amount of data, uh, it makes perfect sense. In fact, you'd be foolish not to use the cloud as not just a solution, but your exclusive solution. I use um, uh, a backup solution for all my uh, computers at home. All my, my wife dumps all of her pictures on a central server and it backs up to the cloud. Uh, I do have multiple backups locally, but you know I'm a, a terabyte or so. It makes perfect sense for just a few dollars a month. I, I can do everything I need in the cloud. It's the same thing for small companies. For big data, we've really narrowed this down and there are two key places where even if you're a huge company, we feel like um, it makes sense to talk about cloud storage. And one of them is obviously disaster recovery. We spent some time this morning talking about all the bad things that can happen to your data. Uh, if, if you're not protecting it, if you're not being genetically diverse, putting it in multiple locations. There are, in fact, many st cloud storage options that'll say, hey, I, I will guarantee there's three copies in three different locations. It's still online. It's still online. So it should be a piece of your genetic diversity or disaster recovery solution, but not the, every, uh, not the entire thing. It differs a little from uh, when one of, the, one of the big cloud guys comes up and talks about uh, where you really need to have disaster recovery. The other one that we think is just obvious, if it's not to everybody else, is if your business is based around data distribution. And one of the classic examples of that really is Netflix. With using Amazon cloud services, a very small group of people in a very short period of time built what is now one of the world's largest data distribution companies almost purely from cloud services very incredible i actually use uh, a product called life 360 i should have made a slide of it but with one click of the button i can see where all of my family is at any given time in fact uh, i got an alert just moments ago my oldest daughter just got back to her dorm room over at CU, so really incredible. And, and uh, the alarm that says she got within 100 yards of her boyfriend hasn't gone off, so that I, I, can, keep, I can keep speaking. Actually, she, you know, we all use it. We all know where each other are, um, and they're fully aware, and they're using it all the time, so it's strangely enough. No, they love it. They really love it. I've got a pretty, I got a pretty conservative family, so they, they, all, they also like to know where I am, so. Uh, and I do my best to never turn the location off. Of course, unless I'm buying a gift for my wife. Right? But, um, so the question now is, what about all the stuff in between? What about the medium-sized companies? And what about the big companies that have a lot of data? And yeah, they've, they've put something up for disaster recovery, but how do I integrate that into my workflow? And that's really what we're gonna talk about. Um, a few things that you may or may not know about the cloud that we wanna just throw out, throw out to you. Um, when you store data on the cloud, there's a lot of rules, um, there's a lot of fees, there's a lot of things that aren't clear until you've actually put your data out and you get your first bill. It tends to be very variable month to month if, if you actually do a lot of data back and forth. So the first thing is, um, from a cost perspective, even if, the, even if storage were free, so you know the cloud guys put a lot of effort into, it's a penny a gigabyte a month or they, they just uh, are pushing that number down within the last week, 0.7 cents per gigabyte per month from Amazon. 
Um, but even if we completely ignore that, even if it were completely free, and some of them are, in fact, doing special things for universities, I'll give you all the storage you want for free, universities absolutely are still coming to us and going, yeah, that's, that's good, it's a little scary, I still want to copy my data locally. Well, part of it has to do with bandwidth. So assume for a minute, um, I, I've got a relatively short backup window. For whatever reason, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna back up most of the time between Saturday from 1 a.m. to 4 a.m. It's very common in a backup situation, uh, especially if I'm doing full backups. Well, the question then is, how much bandwidth do I need? Well, the analogy, this actually came from one of the universities. The analogy was, well, <clears throat> it's as if, I, I love a Ferrari, I love punching down on the accelerator, but I'm gonna walk into that Ferrari dealer and I'm gonna say, you know, I, I, I swear to you, I'm only gonna do it from Saturday morning from 1 a.m. to 4 a.m. rest of the time, you know, I'm the slowest car on the road, so what I really want to do is pay for the Volkswagen Beetle, right? It doesn't work with the car dealer, and it doesn't work with internet service providers normally, unless you're a big guy and have special deals. You have to pay for the bandwidth that you need. So the typical bandwidth that we're finding for a lot of these companies that are doing massive amounts of data um, in, in the 10 gigabit per second is an OC192, which runs somewhere between $100,000 and $150,000 a month huge charges just for the bandwidth that's this natural buffer in between public and private cloud to start with. The other piece is, if it's not clear, almost all the contracts for deep storage in the cloud include a three-month clause. As soon as you put your data up there, even if you delete it two minutes later, you have to pay for three months worth. They get you for the first three months no matter what. Other pieces, uh, download has to be very carefully controlled. As one example, depends on how much data you have up, they allow you sometimes up to 5% a month to, to come down. But um, if I'm gonna download 10 terabytes and I need it now, which is frequently the case if I've lost data, it could cost you as much as $15,000 to get that 10 terabytes back, just based on the, the movement from a, a Glacier-like to an S3-like storage pool. Um, so that's very simple. The other flip side of that is, what if you said, um, I, I don't really care how long uh, it, it takes to get it back, I want to do it at the lowest possible cost. There's a whole cottage industry around this. If it's not clear, you can uh, you know, buy these little tools that trickle the data out of the cloud at a rate to keep, keep the fees down. It can, it can take as much as three months to get that same 10, 10 terabytes back. So there are limitations to that. And if I have a copy of my data locally, and in fact it's cost effective, the, the answer is the cloud can also be local. So what are we going to do? How do we provide that local cloud? Uh, and this really was the subject of the summit, uh, to the, the last one that, that Spectre did where we announced Black Pearl. The discussion was around public cloud, private cloud. And very specifically, for the last 35, 36 years, we as a company have been doing tape. So the question is, how do I make tape easy? How do I take all those uh, issues around, you know, I've got to control the robot, i got to figure out how to collect the data and stream it to those drives appropriately so that the library works well. Well, for us, uh, it's trying to mimic those three things we started with, simplicity, scalability, accessibility, and mimic them in our private cloud by using this product, Black Pearl. The goal of simplifying tape, having some methodology for automatic scaling, a universal interface that's the similar, similar to or the same uh, as the cloud, um, and, and just providing a means by which that your workflow can be simple. So when I talk about local storage, it's a very straightforward and simple thing to integrate. So that really is where Black Pearl comes in. Black Pearl, the uh, intelligent controller, the gateway to deep storage, does in fact uh, provide this simple approach to not just a cloud-like storage place, but uh, to archive it in an object, uh, object methodology for great scalability. So really, what makes Black Pearl revolutionary? Well, it is an S3 interface. Um, we use uh, caching, sequential media support to control those tape drives. And we use object storage. So it is an object storage database. Um, we, there are many object devices out there, most of them disk. It's harder to do it with tape. Um, so we led the way in this particular area. And it's very simple to integrate. We'll talk about how you actually integrate this uh, into a system here in just a minute. But th one of the keys is just make this simple for customers. So this goes to a, a very short period of time that it takes to integrate. And in fact, Jeff Bronstein, as in one of the breakouts, there he is in the back, is gonna show you from scratch 
building a client for a body-worn camera while you sit there. It takes about 10 minutes from scratch to, okay, I have this camera, I need to get the content of it onto Black Pearl. He's gonna build, compile a client, and show you how it works. So just for clarity, it's, it's a really fast thing. The question then is how do we save cost? There are many ways, and we'll go through them, but one of them has to do with how do I get data into that tape library? Typically, you have to buy some sort of third-party software, an HSM, a data mover, to control the tiering of the data, to control the tape library, control the robot, stream the data. It's very complicated, and many of those charge you by the gigabyte that you're moving in and out of that tape library. Well, the concept here is how do we take that HSM and eliminate the need for it in most workflows? So, Let's be very careful here. This isn't saying that industry's gone, it's dead. There are plenty of reasons why you still need it. If you're doing backup, there's companies like Commvault do dedupe and schedule backups. That's not our business. But in the pure tiering aspect, the movement of the data, if that's all that you're using that particular piece of software for, we can, in fact, eliminate that with Black Pearl. This is the dramatic place where I push, there it goes. Oh, that was you. Oh, oh so I'm advancing. Sorry, it's revolutionary, you didn't see any of that stuff. We'll go back here in a minute. So let's build the entire ecosystem real quick. This is essentially the whole uh, Spectre ecosystem on one slide. First of all, we have uh, uh, Verdi, uh, which is a uh, NAS box, SIFS, NFS. It's, it's essentially a SaaS-based, uh, fast access network tax storage device. We've been selling it for uh, two and a half years or so. Great product. The newest thing that we just announced basically one month ago is Verdi DPE. So it is in fact a new technology using shingled magnetic recording drives that gets us to some incredibly new price, new price points. We sell that for nine cents a gigabyte. Nine cents a gigabyte. So you should have been all part of that announcement roughly a month ago, but incredible interest. We, the, 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 Initial sales and quotes from that have I'm just piled up. It's absolutely gonna be a huge successful product for us. Um, because it's nine cents a gigabyte and it's very dense, I can get almost eight petabytes of it in a single rack. As a file-based system, it, it provides a great platform for bulk storage, for network attached bulk storage. It's not meant to be tier one. We're not trying to get into the you know, tier one SSD, I'm gonna run American Airlines database system on it. This is bulk storage. So the question then, let's get back to the cloud, is the cloud obviously talks a different language. It talks objects, it talks HTTP, RESTful, S3, amongst others, but uh, S3 being the primary one we'll talk about. And the question then, as we go into customers and talk to them is, well, how do I get my workflow, which is primarily a file-based workflow, to talk to cloud language, whether it's Amazon or us? And the answer really is integration of S3 clients. And as you guys already know, there are plenty of products out there that already have an S3 output. So if it has an S3 output and you point it at us with this new product we're talking about, uh, very minor modifications, it should work. Just the, in fact, I'm gonna show you on the hands-on live here in a minute, an absolute off-the-shelf S3 product that works perfectly with our Black Pearl solution, no modifications at all. Literally, we load it up, point it at it, give it the credentials, and we're in total control. Absolutely amazing. We've also built that S3 interface into the Verdi products as an output. So you can create a volume, we'll do this in hands-on lab. You can create a volume and say, anything you save to this volume automatically creates a copy that is S3 directed out to us, and then we can do anything you want with it. You want it on tape, you want it on disk, you want it somewhere else. So, as a direct backup, as a way to archive your data, very simply, you can do it from the file-based world directly into S3, so that's very exciting. Question then is, what do I need in between this interface and talking to tape? Well, clearly you need the ability to control the robots, you need the ability to cache that data, very fast disk-based cache, so that uh, I can stream that data properly to the tape drives. Uh, and I need an object database. We actually put it on SSD to keep track of every single object that you send me. What's the uh, MD5 of it? What's, where is it stored on tape? Which tape is it on? How is it broken up? All that information is stored in a very fast database inside Black Pearl. So the key to the whole story is all those features and functions to interface between the S3 front end 
and the deep storage back end, which up until today has really been tape, is contained inside Black Pearl. So one of the things we're adding uh, as part of the announcement today really is uh, online disk. So it's SAS-based disk. Think of it as a pinned cache. It's a place that I can store data that I need to get to very regularly. It's really uh, drives that I can add inside Black Pearl and I can designate uh, data to be stored on that. We won't go into a whole lot more detail. We can talk about it in the hands-on lab. Um, but let's go on for the hands-on lab. We're actually gonna talk about each one of these products and we're actually gonna focus. This is, this is gonna be a lot of fun. I'm the product guy, so this is fun stuff for me. So um, we're gonna focus on all the really easy ways I can get data in and out of Black Pearl. So uh, really simply, uh, we're gonna start with command line, writing scripts. We've actually written our own uh, window interface, kind of like FileZilla, lets me drag and drop. And then we're gonna show you a few products that have this already built in and with kind of right click archive and a number of these different products, I can send data off to Black Pearl. So very exciting that it really is so easy. And that's what we're gonna focus on in the hands-on lab. So uh, first, I'm gonna show you uh, one customer in particular, and this is, this is really interesting. When we started this whole Black Pearl project, um, you know, we had a, this vision to simplify the workflow, but there's companies coming out of the woodwork, some that we've never heard of before, that have an incredible technology that makes somebody's workflow easier, whether it's a producer, a director, the M&E space, or an HPC. This particular uh, company focuses on uh, metadata and how do I search and control data, not just locally, but worldwide. So let's listen to Architecta. Hi, I'm Graham Beasley. I work for a company called Architecta. We're a US-based company that our roots are from Australia, and I'm the CEO of one of American operations. Our product is called MediaFlux, and it's basically a, a data management product that's built around um, uh, metadata, and that's this key attribute for searching. So if you're using it with a black pearl or tape or disk, what we do is we tag all the data with very smart metadata, so it's very easy for people to come back and find that data from an archive. The, one of the key things that Black Pearl does for our, our customers, it basically virtualizes a lot of the tape management. And so literally we just have another tape silo or another silo for data called Black Pearl. And it deals with all the ickiness of where the actual individual tapes are, whether it's on this volume or in this carousel or cassette or whatever. It just goes and gets it. So basically all of that is, is virtualized or abstract from the customer. Basically the customer just says, hey, MediaFlux, we want to get all the, all the dogs that are Labrador Retrievers, and then we'll go get all those dogs and bring them out. You know? Well, our, one of the ways our product integrates with Black Pearl is we can bring Black Pearl into a legacy storage environment. You don't have to get rid of all your old storage things. You can keep your same disk, you can keep your same tapes, but by bringing Black Pearl in, uh, all the data that we manage going forward can be through the Black Pearl device and all the tapes that are attached to it. The great thing about that for the customers, they don't have to get rid of all their old legacy data. One of the challenges we have is how do you migrate the data from the old to the new? This way we're not saying throw out the old, you can actually bring in the new and slowly start moving it over. We have storage policies that can control that migration and that's one of the things that we're working on together. You'll notice he described uh, our entire business of controlling the tape library and tracking tapes as the ickiness. So, I, I find more personal joy in it than that. But nevertheless, we, we abstract that from his, his level so they don't have to think about it. So just having S3 output to make this simple really makes life easier for a lot of these companies. And in fact, the company list is uh, pretty extreme at this point. Um, a few of these are uh, specific tape only partners um, that haven't integrated with Black Pearl, but the bulk majority of them uh, either have a client already a client in development or um, they're asking to be put on our list. We'll have a, uh, a client uh, certification program very shortly to make sure that they all live up to the top level standards of what we expect of something that uh, integrates with Black, Black Pearl, but the list is growing uh, dramatically and every win that we have at a, uh, a large customer tends to drag five or six more of these partners with them. So the world is headed this direction and the beauty is none of them really mind because it's an industry standard interface. So we go in and say, well, is this really proprietary to just Spectra? No, 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 this is S3. This is the standard interface that the world is using, not just for the cloud, but very frequently within a data center for failover. So if you have S3, it's a, it's a great technology to, to really push your company forward. 
So then the question is, why do I even need all of these various layers underneath Black Pearl? And that's, we're gonna focus the rest of our time on this, uh, how this works, and the products that fit. And the best example, uh, Matt hinted at it uh, before using the Major League Baseball as an example, but sporting teams in general, it's a great analogy. I've got a number of different cameras. Uh, I'm, I'm videotaping and audio uh, from multiple angles. Uh, I'm editing that down on NAS or some sort of a tier one. As soon as that game's over, then what I really wanna do is store that game, all the different shots and the edited down compiled version um, into uh, a variety of different layers. Why, why? It'd be great to put a copy on online disc so that that's readily accessible, so that for the first couple weeks, people from all over can get to it, they can grab it, I have complete random access, they may even edit new clips because they did something on the news, save it back so that everybody can share. So it's a random access. Uh, fast access, I don't need it for very long because most of the time you only see clips from a game for you know, the news that night or maybe that through the weekend. But then, if I'm a sporting team, Major League Baseball, many of the, uh, the big football teams, I want to keep the full last two seasons on something that's random access. Well, why? Well, if, if I'm doing a story on a particular player, uh, Peyton Manning, well, is he getting, no, you guys aren't all from Denver, is he getting better or worse? That's the conversation in the hallways. He's not, not getting better right now. He's a little older. So, you know, if I want to pull all of his interceptions from the last two or three seasons and do a story on it, that's not really... You need a lot, because he's thrown a lot of passes and a lot of interceptions. Um, but, you know, that's not really a great thing to pull from a tape library. It could be on 100 different tapes. It could take me hours to get all of that back. I need something that's random access. I need something that's nearline disk. Then, of course, if it's the Super Bowl or World Series, I never want to lose it. It's critical that, you know, we just had the anniversary of, what is it, the 100th Super Bowl or whatever, uh, 50th. I'm not a sports guy. I'm sure somebody in here knows the exact the number. Super Bowl oh, you shouldn't, <laughs> you shouldn't admit that in public. Oh, wow. I was there. Sorry, I didn't mean to personally insult you. But <laughs> The, there was a guy, right, that had the copy of the first Super Bowl, and he made a lot of money on it because he was the only one that still had a copy. So, as Matt said, you know, data is valuable for a long period of time, so I want to keep it. So the question is, do I really need to move it dynamically in tiers as a data mover? No, not this kind of data. I can put it on all those layers underneath all at the same time and then expire them over time as I don't need them anymore. So if we use that as a core concept, we've got a new technology that's releasing as part of Black Pearl that we call advanced bucket management. I'm a product guy, that's, that's the cool name we came up with, advanced bucket management. Someday we'll have you know, a, a great name associated with that, that that's great, greatly marketable, but the concept is very straightforward. If within Black Pearl, uh, I'm gonna say, I've got multiple layers of data at the bottom, and you can see at the bottom, um, I've got offline disk, nearline disk. Uh, you can have a lot more nearline disk here. Um, a copy, I want a copy that stays in a tape library so that I have relatively ready access to it. But I also want a copy that I can eject. I'm going to send it to a small library and say automatically eject. And at the same time, I can assign persistence rules. I only need it to stay on that online disk for 30 days. On uh, uh, the nearline disk, keep it for two years. I need the, the full copy of it on two years then what I can do is set up a rules and policies within Black Pearl so that I can do a single put to a single bucket and anything that goes into that bucket then replicates the data properly, distributes it to the various storage domains, one of them even be eject, and in fact keeps a timer on all that data so that after a period of time I can even expire it. So if, that, this, if that's not clear, this is really revolutionary from a simplifying the workflow. There are plenty of software packages that'll do this, that'll tier. They charge you separately than the storage domain, sometimes with gigabyte, uh, dollars per gigabyte. This is included in Black Pearl. We don't charge for this feature. We don't charge for this feature. So your ability to layer, to tier, is now free. Very interesting. The, the first question is, well, how do we keep track of where the data is? What if I want the data back uh, you know, one month from now, well, the get gives the data back from the most available layer. So we keep track of where it is. It, I like a bucket list. I wish I'd have thought of that. Darn. Okay, we have a marketing name. 
So advanced market management is great. That nearline disk is what's really exciting to us, and we're announcing Arctic Blue. So Arctic Blue, oh, thank you. Arctic Blue is really a revolutionary new nearline disk that's object-based. We've hinted at it here. It should be pretty obvious where we're headed um, with some new features that we believe really will change the way uh, storage works in a lot of these different workflows. So let's just run through real quick. Um, we'll go through, I'll just lay it out. We're going to go through the product itself. We're going to go through the hardware. We'll go through the features and we'll end up with how do you actually use this in a real live workflow? So we've got a, another customer. We're going to go through where exactly where it fits, what problems it's solving. Uh, and, and quite frankly, that's the exciting part of, uh, of the business. So imagine never having to delete your data. Automatic copies to genetically diverse storage. We talked about the value of genetic diversity before. We can do that automatically now with advanced bucket management not ever having to replace your disk systems, at least on that three-year boundary. Because if you're a typical disk system, even the ones they call archive tend to be three-year products. So IT data center guys are pretty used to the cranes coming in every three years to, to move my old disks out or move them to the side and I'm gonna put a new system in. This is longer disk than that. In fact, our goal is the longevity very near the cost of tape with the accessibility of disk. So it's very, uh, sounds very simple, but to achieve that took a tremendous amount of engineering. So this is a, this is a huge development for Spectra. So let's be real clear where it fits. Uh, obviously from a cost and performance standpoint, uh, if you uh, were at some of the recent storage conferences, there was a gentleman from Microsoft that uh, Matt referenced that his, his conclusion was tape always wins forever. They're sandbaggers. They can get to a lot higher capacity, a lot lower cost. Um, so no matter where we're headed, tape is a great solution for long-term storage. It was a really great speech, by the way. If you haven't seen it, we'll, we'll put the link in the uh, press kit probably. Um, so automated tape libraries have a, a very good performance, but very low cost. Enterprise disk, whether we're talking, we'll just generically call it enterprise disks, disk sits higher on the performance cost curve. We're talking about really a new category, something that sits in between that's very close to the cost of tape. Um, not quite the longevity, tape is still, you know, we, we're, we're saying 25, 35 years for tape, right? For the, the media itself to last. Um, this is significantly longer than enterprise disk, but has very nearly the performance of an online disk. So it is specifically a seven-year disk product. And we're actually going to talk about how we do that and how we get there. Um, with very good online performance, we're getting a gigabyte per second uh, or more, and we can actually show you that in the hands-on lab, with uh, really incredible power consumption and incredible density. You, I don't know if you have seen some of the systems that the cloud guys used, one of, uh, one of which they call Pelican, that they've kind of been hinting at but not showing anybody exactly what it is. They talk about what the density is, how many drives, how many terabytes per you know, square foot in the data center. This is basically at the same density as a Pelican system. So uh, this provides that kind of a uh, capability to the general data center. You don't have to be you know, uh, Microsoft or Facebook and invest you know, billions of dollars in your uh, IT infrastructure to get to that kind of density. We're providing it to everyone. And in fact, we're launching it at uh, 10 cents a gigabyte. And you get there very, very quickly uh, to that 10 cents. Uh, you don't have to buy multiple petabytes uh, to get there. And we'll show you what that cost structure looks like. So again, we started with this basic overview of what the Black Pearl ecosystem is. Uh, very powerful from integrating. This is the nearline disk layer underneath Black Pearl. Provides that extra layer with the, the value of random recall but low cost long-term storage. Um, the slides, I think we're, uh, we're making these available in the press kits as well, if you guys uh, uh, want access to these. So Ar Arctic Blue, again, with the longevity and cost of tape, um, but performance of disk, at least the accessibility of disk. Uh, we're going for random access uh, across any of the bands, uh, any of the chassis, you can get to all of it at the same time. Uh, and we are trying to eliminate that three-year obsolescence cycle that's really present in most disk systems. How are we doing it? We've got a new technology we call drive lifecycle management. You may have heard the term before. We use it uh, to refer to tape drives. I can keep a spare 
tape drive in a library so that if something goes wrong, I can flip over and start using that spare tape drive. Same concept, at least in general, applies to a disk system. If something goes wrong with a disk, I need a global spare to be able to repair to. But I'm also very carefully controlling how that disk operates. And there's two major ways we do it. We'll get into that in just a minute. But it's based on the same technology we launched with uh, Verdi DPE, which is the shingled magnetic recording drives. And we'll show you what that means and how they work here in a minute. But the goal for us has been to extend the life of these drives, here's the kicker, by powering them down when they're not in use. Not, it has been done before, it hasn't been done well, quite frankly, and we're gonna show you the right way to do it here in just a minute. So, uh, how does it build? We'll go through the hardware real quick. Um, obviously, we've been talking about Black Pearl as the controller. Black Pearl is, in fact, the intelligence. You need a Black Pearl as part of the system. It's where the intelligence lies, uh, both for uh, streaming the data uh, to Arctic Blue, as well as controlling when they're powered up and down. So, Arctic, uh, uh, excuse me, Black Pearl starts at either a 2U or a 4U unit. Um, get into the details of that, but it, it's basically a controller and a gateway. The Arctic Blue system is a very large bank of disks, and we've got one across the hall for the uh, hands on open. You can pull disks in and out. It's kind of cool to see, if you haven't seen a system like that before, almost 100 drives in a 4U. So we're using 96. 96 in a 4U unit. So uh, it's built in bands, and we split each unit into four bands. So each band is 192 terabyte raw, which is a 23 drive band. Uh, we're using the equivalent of triple parity, local erasure coding, triple parity. Um, so you have the equivalent of 20 drives that are data um, and one global spare for each band. So as you add bands, you add a global spare per band. We'll show you how it's built here. So the first expansion, we ask, you buy at least two bands. If it's not obvious, that's so. I can power one of them down sometimes. And if I do that, that's what allows me to extend the life. If you just bought one band, it's powered up all the time, it's a, it's a three-year product, because that's how long the drives are gonna last, right? So after that first uh, unit, after you buy the first two, you add in increments of 23 drives um, until you get to the 96 total. And uh, then when you're, you can buy more and more, uh, so a single, a single chassis ends up being 768 terabytes raw, you can add up to eight of those in a rack. So a rack this size will hold about six petabytes if, if you need that full thing loaded. Um, the two band requirement per uh, shelf only really applies to the first unit. You can add just a single band because we treat all of them as a single pool underneath Black Pearl. So that's the way it's built. Now, how does it actually work? We're using these very wide bands. There's a great reason for that. If I stripe across a, a wide number, a large number of disks, and I need to keep my striping within each band so that I can power them down effectively. But if I do that, I can get pretty decent performance, a gigabyte per second or more, uh, read, write. And one of the keys is if I keep my data restricted to a band, a particular piece of data, then the ones that aren't being used, I can power down. And we use uh, blue to rep the Arctic blue to represent the powered down drives in these pictures. So the way it works is if I do a get um, that's only on, for instance, that red band, it just powers up the red band, life is good. If then I do a, a get that requires data across the entire system, we do have the ability to power them all up uh, at the same time. So that gives us full random access to all of the drives, all the bands in the entire system if you need to. And the, the key here really is that other companies have tried this before. There was one not too far from here called Copan um, that attempted to do this based on made technology. Great company, but one of the big drawbacks was the assumption is the primary motivation for data center guys is power consumption. And because of that, I, I'm never gonna bring all of my bands alive at the same time. So I'm gonna guarantee I never get over a certain power consumption, but you, know, you have to trickle your data back and bring bands up in, in uh, uh, different sequences to be able to get it all back. It's also to do with the heat and the vibration. And heat and vibration. Exactly, so, the, so they were focused on those things and you get that benefit most of the time with Arctic Blue unless you do a mass uh, read or a mass get. For instance, I'm searching for uh, all the times Peyton Manning through an interception, and it happens to be on here. It's likely to be across striped, not taking shots at banning again, but it's likely to be striped across all of the bands in my entire system. I, I have, I have zero idea what you're talking about. 
I, oh, yeah. Pete Manning? Sorry about that. It can run forever with all of them up at the same time from a cooling, uh, from a power perspective. We completely support all of them being up. The drawback then is I can't power them down to extend the life. And that is, in fact, the very next topic. That's a very good question. So how do we, how do we actually extend the life? There's a standard, if you guys are, have ever looked at annual fail rate curves, there's a fairly standard curve that most of the hard drive guys publish. And it's, you know, at the very beginning, sometimes you get a little extra failure drives because of the manufacturing process. Somebody sneezed in the factory, whatever it is, they've got a few drives that go bad a little early. But then there's this really comfortable area that's flat for a relatively long period of time where you know the rate at which drives will fail. And as it turns out, it's very, very predictable. And they choose their warranty, typically three years, based on what that annual fail rate curve looks like. Because you don't want to have your warranty out there where your annual fail rate's growing. So if I have the ability to put drives effectively in suspended animation, then what I can do is I can drive the annual failure rate curve down and shove it out to the right at the same time. My goal being to provide a failure rate that makes sense both for us and our customer. One of the options is I can just say it's seven years and I just replace drives and I'll go out of business, right? If I can, in fact, push, put these drives in suspended animation, I can reduce the annual fail rate curve, and because it's not running, it's like time didn't pass. As long as I maintain them right and bring them up, make sure the mechanical parts work, there's other issues involved, I'm simplifying a little bit, I can make these feel like a seven-year drive. So our goal is to provide something that feels like a seven-year product at a very low cost. Remember, we talked about 10 cents a gigabyte for this. We'll talk about how that all fits together. That's not. And that annual failure curve you just showed that Seagate doesn't match any of the field reports from people like Google who publish data. So we do have that, and uh, uh, there were a couple other really big companies that had tens of thousands of drives in use, and we used we combined Seagate's information, the data from that, the data from the other company to try to predict what our, this isn't actually our annual failure rate curve, that would be proprietary data, I'm showing you a physical representation. Um, and we're, we're doing a lot of tests and work with those manufacturers to understand the difference between um, idling, uh, you know, the head touching the platter, uh, the mechanics, the bearings, there's a lot of things involved, but we're very, very tightly working with those disc manufacturers to try to make those predictions. There's a pretty good paper coming out from them shortly, we understand, that'll highlight a little bit of this. Um, their goal in these drives is to call them an archive drive. Um, our goal was to treat it like an archive system, but also give it online performance by using something like Black Pearl, where we can uh, manipulate the data coming in and out to give you more online performance. So it's really an exciting combination of, of two or three technologies. So, and you are doing what Copan used to call drive aerobics? Uh, we have an ability to come alive and uh, sample the drives to maintain them. So that's part of what, yeah, what our roadmap is. Right, right. So we're trying to take all of those things into account. So real quick, let's take just a few minutes to talk about shingled magnetic recording. And the easiest way is to use a video from our, our brethren over at Seagate where they ex explain the technology. This is the core technology inside. Our planet, seven billion inhabitants, creating a lot of data, a lot. One problem, where do we store all of that data? We are rapidly approaching the physical limits of how much data can be written on a single hard disk platter. Let's take a closer look. On a conventional hard disk drive, data is written in tracks. The closer the tracks, the more data you can fit on a platter. Using today's perpendicular recording technology, data is written in tracks only about 75 nanometers wide, smaller than a flu virus. But we've hit the limit. If we're going to increase the amount of data that can fit on a disk, we need a new approach. Introducing Seagate's Shingled Magnetic Recording, or SMR. SMR is a breakthrough technology that allows for greater capacity, which means more data can be written on a drive without increasing size or form factor. Instead of laying tracks next to each other, we overlap them, much like shingles on a house. With this technique, we increase capacity by 25%. 
25% more capacity means hard drives with the lowest cost per gigabyte and capacities of five terabytes and beyond. Launching a bold new approach to the hard disk drive. Same size, more data. Seagate's shingled magnetic recording technology. Shipping now. Seagate, storage for life. So Arctic Blue actually uses the eight terabyte uh, version of the shingled magnetic recording drives, and that is, in fact, the same drive we're using in, in uh, Verdi DPE on the file system side. So it sounds really great when we describe that as uh, more capacity for free. Uh, it's not necessarily the case. If, if you're familiar with the drives, um, you have to use them in a very specific way. These aren't standard drives you can put in a Windows-based system. It would bring the drive to its knees, the way that Windows accesses data randomly. And it has to do with the fact that when I, when I shingle on a house, I actually still have that piece of the shingle underneath. On an SMR drive, when I overwrite and I shingle, I'm actually destroying part of the next track next to it. So you end up with these little problems that have to be solved. If I'm doing any kind of random access, reclaiming of space, I've got a hole, look a hole. I want to fill that free space. Well, one of the things we have to do to fill the free space is actually, uh, or, or if I'm going to try to deal with a traditional drive, I write over it and it uh, could kill the track underneath. So if I'm going to fill that space, what I have to do is unload the data from the top of that hole, fill the hole, and then move the data back. So if it's not clear, that should be just slightly terrifying. How do you do that? How do you give it time? Uh, how does it defragment itself over time? How do we give it data the way that it wants to be given? And how is that? Well, it's pretty specific. These SMR drives like to have large blocks written to them sequentially, in order, and they don't really like to have a lot of changes. Written like flash. There's something else that sounds a lot like. Sounds a lot like a tape drive. Turns out, we kind of know how to do that. We've been doing that for 36 years. So the technology of how to use these is so similar to tape. And because our systems in DPE, our RAID-based system in Arctic Blue, this local erasure coding, because they are uh, software-based systems, I can adapt to how to use these drives properly. So it's very exciting. It's almost as if the technology was designed specifically for Spectra. And it turns out the engineers that do it are just like four miles up the road. So it's a great way to collaborate. Uh, with them on how to use the technology. So it took a tape company to really unleash the power. And it's pretty simple. Uh, it's really based around Black Pearl. And the concept is I, I have data coming at me from a bunch of different directions, multiple clients all throwing data at me. And that's not going to be a good thing for these SMR drives. So what Black Pearl specifically does is I have a very large and fast cache built into Black Pearl. I have the ability to forcefully make the data sequential and force it to be written off to these SMR drives in order, exactly like they like to have the data. Under a system like Arctic Blue that's object-based, I don't necessarily have to delete the data in a random way. I can very carefully control that underneath Black Pearl. So because of Black Pearl, because of that S3 interface that lets me power up and down, so if that's not intuitively obvious, if I'm a file-based system and I power a drive down and it takes 30 seconds to get to my first byte, a lot of file-based systems will not like that. But under S3, I have time. It's a restful interface. If it takes 30 seconds to get to my first byte and then it starts stringing at me at a gigabyte per second or more, life is good. So Black Pearl is, in fact, the thing that enables the entire product. So let's run through the, product, the, the core features of the product real quick. Total cost of ownership, 10 cents a gig. We do it by the very first full expansion unit, the first 4U, 768 terabytes, sells for uh, whatever that is, 72,000. It ends up being 10 cents a gigabyte. Oh, 76.8K. That's the list price. So it's 10 cents a gigabyte. That's raw. raw. That's raw, uncompressed. Raw, uncompressed. We don't include compression, although we have compression on by default. Because I've got such an incredibly powerful processor, I can compress faster than I can write. And I can abandon a, an object in the middle if uh, it is, in fact, uh, uncompressible. So we have compression on, but we, that's free. That's for our customer's benefit. Um, power down lowers operating expenses. In fact, lowers power by as much as 70% over the full unit being on at the same time. A full unit takes about 750 watts when it's in full read-write mode. Very dense. I'm getting, uh, as I said, a little over six petabytes in a rack 
On the DPE side, we get about 7.4 petabytes per rack, similar technology from a drive standpoint. Um, so more space or less space in a data center obviously saves money as well. Very simple because I'm integrating with S3 into my customer's workflow. Because of advanced bucket management, if this didn't click for you before, 10 cents a gigabyte for the storage, you want a second copy on ejected tape, media only runs two, two and a half cents a gig. Right? If, if I'm not keeping it in the library, I'm just ejecting it, I'm gonna send it off site, very low cost. So for 12, 13 cents a gig, I can have two copies and one of them off site. So it's a, a great way to fit it into the whole ecosystem. Because of Black Pearl, the data movement capability, uh, advanced bucket management, I can get rid of some of those dollar per gigabyte movement charges. And because of the seven year life, if I'm comparing head to head with a three year disk archive system, you gotta buy two of those systems for every Arctic Blue. So there's a great cost savings there and amortization over a longer period of time. From a protection standpoint, nothing else touches this. Let's run through it. Uh, local erasure coding, it's roughly the equivalent of uh, triple parity RAID. We are using uh, ZFS as a file system, uh, Z3. So there's, you have to lose four drives in any given band before you ever lose data. And we'll come back to that in just a minute. Um, we're also doing checksums all the way from the original object level to the media that's stored, including any chunks that take place along the way. So we're maintaining uh, error checking CRC all the way through. And I have an incredible level of uh, undetected bit error rate. Um, so disks have this bit rot issue, right? You, you, there's going to be a few bits bad here and there, uh, depending on how much data you're storing. If it's just JPEGs, you know, a pixel here or there may not matter. If you're storing financial data, it could very well be the difference between a guy having a million dollar bill and a hundred dollar bill, you know, uh, at the end of the month. So we, it just depends on what kind of data you're storing. 10 to the 67th is internally. If you consider the rest of the system and all the ins and outs, it's probably half that. But still, those are huge numbers. Most people don't even have a concept of how big of a number that is. 10 to the 67th is roughly the number of atoms in the solar system. If I'm storing the value of every atom in the solar system, only one of them is gonna get by me, and I know it wrong, and I, and I don't detect it. Then I use my uh, local erasure coding, my RAID Z3, to correct it. Well, if I combine those two and how fast it takes to rebuild a drive and you use any of the popular calculators, our probability of uh, any data loss is roughly one in two million years. It's a very simple thing to reproduce that data for you. Uh, if you'd like to do that side, it's a fun little math uh, exercise. With tape out, very simple, low cost, second copy. And in fact, I can create an air gap as well. We talked about that this morning with genetic diversity. Performance is actually incredible. You would expect hey, it's low cost, it's uh, powered down, it's seven years, I must be giving up something, it must be crazy slow, it must be, uh, you know, take a long time to get data back. And we talked about the performance, gigabyte per second or more out of this, enabled partially by that very fast cache inside Black Pearl. And at the same time, if you guys haven't followed the, the Black Pearl progress, Black Pearl simultaneously can be putting 70 terabytes a day out to a tape drive. So I've got two different huge systems that have the capability of very, very fast um, access, both read and write. And in fact, when you put Arctic Blue in front of a tape library, it actually can make it better. So if it's not clear, we've talked about, well, how does this, what, what's the benefits of a tape library? Well, you get to store stuff forever, it's really cheap. But if you have to restore stuff, it could take a while. It's pretty expensive, it's hard to use, may, may take a while to get those, that data back. If I have this as part of the platform, I'm adding random access capability, I'm adding fast access, I'm adding gigabyte per second to my tape library system. So it's very, very effective uh, as part of the ecosystem. What's next? Wouldn't it be great if I can have Black Pearl at multiple locations and replicate that data to multiple locations? One of the main things customers are asking us for, the enterprise grade customers. Wouldn't it be great if I could make the cloud actually part of the ecosystem? You want another layer dropped on Amazon, dropped on Google, Swift Stack, where, wherever you want it? Wouldn't it be great if I could make that part of my ecosystem? And wouldn't it be great if I could move data back and forth between my online layer and my nearline layer? So th this is where we're headed, and we're headed very quickly to this uh, for our top customers. So a lot of capabilities coming that, that make this not just a single data center system, but this can be the new way that data centers interact worldwide. Is that happening now or is that something that's 
That's uh, mi middle of next year is our target for all those things. So we wanted to give you just a little highlight in, you know, because the first set of questions is, well, what's next? And can I do X, Y, and Z? These are the next three things our customers are asking for. So we're headed in that direction next. Total cost of ownership. Let's do a quick comparison. We started with the cloud. We started with comparing. Let's go back to comparing our products to the cloud. And as you know, the cloud guys have done an exceptional job talking about a penny a gigabyte a month. Penny a gigabyte a month for deep storage. Well, how do our products compare? S3 is more if you're really an online kind of disk. And I just threw in a pretty bottom of the line, if you recognize it, not to take shots at them, uh, a pretty bottom of the line disk three year product for uh, 50 grand to get 100 terabytes. That works out to, if we put it in the same terms as the cloud, about a penny and a half a month per gigabyte. So let's look at, at our products. Now ours are all hardware plus support over the life of the product. Hardware, so I'm including support, the total cost that a customer would pay us for the entire life of that product. So that's five years of support on our current Verdi product. So the Verdi product actually is 0.7 cents per gigabyte per month for four petabytes. Four petabytes, I didn't do the same comparison because that's roughly what you can fit with a Verdi SAS. For the Verdi DPE we talked about, again, 7.4 in a full rack, gets us down to 0.3 cents a gigabyte a month. That's pretty attractive, and that's a file-based system. Just three years, though. Arctic Blue, because it's seven years, gets me down to 17 hundredths of a cent per gigabyte per month. That, that's pretty revolutionary. You can't get that anywhere from the cloud, uh, and I'll show you why here in a minute. Tape always wins. That should be... That should be the last thing on anybody's article. Tape always wins. Tape always wins. <laughs> Tape always wins. So we never include compression, but I'm going to throw it out just to say, if your data is compressible, if your data is compressible, uh, typically uh, a normal data stream that is compressible, we get about two and a half. If I factor that in, Arctic Blue suddenly is seven hundredths of a cent a gigabyte. There's a lot of dependencies on that. Have you already compressed it and not? So everybody understands it's not everybody doesn't get that but you can get that low with compressible data on the flip side we talked about some of those fees on the cloud assume I'm only gonna uh, recall 10% or so of my data even at that rate it boosts the prices up to roughly a penny penny and a half a gigabyte just for the fees and then again I'm storing a lot of data 7.4 petabytes is pretty extreme on the cloud don't everybody's aware that's a lot of data a full rack, even for a data center, that's a lot of data. That requires an IT staff usually to have seven petabytes of data. But if, if I'm going to have that same kind of internet connection that we talked about, now we're at three or four cents a gigabyte, even for the deep storage in the cloud, just supported over that one year period. So there's, there's a big difference, but, but cost is not the only thing. Cost is not the only reason to have your private cloud. It's about ownership. It's about the accessibility and how it's used. So let's jump into a very specific, this is the last thing and we're gonna to go to break. We're gonna talk about how this is used in an actual customer, which kind of is the whole point here, right? This particular one is Avid. If you're not familiar with Avid, they're one of the world leaders in uh, video editing. So uh, it's kind of them and Adobe and a few little uh, really great companies, but smaller companies. Um, but Avid is really tends to be the leader in most TV stations, sporting events, and the like. And their system is pretty straightforward. Um, all the pieces are tied together, and they're all tied around what they call ISIS. So it's, it's a very fast access, uh, very expensive storage. Crazy low latency. I can edit 4K right on it, and it still works, which is not the case if I try to do that on my laptop. Um, ingest, pretty simple. I got a bunch of cameras coming in. One of the most common things we hear from customers is, well, I got 20 cameras coming in from the field. They're all on SSD. I dock them somewhere. There's no way I'm dropping them all on ISIS. That's too expensive. So I'm going to drop them all on a NAS. There's a really pretty green box that should look familiar. Um, I'm going to drop them all on a NAS. And what I really want is to make sure that none of that data ever goes away. So the first thing I want to do is drop a copy of it on tape. Remember we talked about S3 output? So I can drop a copy on a volume on our NAS that automatically feeds to Black Pearl. So there's one. The other one is the way the workflow works is typically I'm going to transcode. I'm going to take a high def version stored on ISIS. I'm going to take a standard def version, and the standard def is what I edit on. Makes it faster. I can transform the data all around. My workstations work better. So I'm actually editing on the standard def. What happens is they take the high def version, 
and they, through an archive provider, send it to Black Pearl. So that a week later, when I'm going to do the full rendering, I can bring it all back. That doesn't sound like a good application for tape. That is a perfect application for Arctic Blue. I'm going to stash the high def many, many, many terabytes of it temporarily for two or three weeks in big chunks so that I can get it back and actually do the final render. So we've got this really close partnership. And in fact, I think this morning we sold our first system um, that integrates Black Pearl, the archive manager, the client, um, and uh, storage. So I think the first one was a tape library. So we haven't started shipping Arctic Blue quite yet. Um, but the first system got sold this morning. So let's hear from Avid. Frank Capria, I work for Avid Technology. I am the director of product management for our asset management product line. Media assets um, are valuable, and they have, nobody knows how long an asset will be valuable for. Uh, syndication deals come up, um, and a content owner might need to pull something off the shelf. And, you know, because a new syndication deal has come up and they have to repurpose those assets. They might have to do it for international distribution. They might have to do it for online distribution. So they need to be able to pull those assets off the shelf and not just pull the asset itself, the whole show. They want to pull all the pieces that went into making the show so that they can re-edit it seamlessly. So it, it doesn't just look like it was chopped up randomly. Uh, you know, you, losing something like that is losing millions of dollars. You cannot recreate a sporting event. You cannot recreate, you know, you can't afford to get the cast of Seinfeld back together again. Um, so you really need to preserve your assets and you really need to be able to put them on a shelf and be able to go back to them in 30 or 40 years. Um, we had no idea going in how deeply embedded the uh, Black Pearl solution could be within Interplay Archive and that it will connect directly to your Interplay assets and have complete, seamless, all the functionality you have in Interplay Archive uh, and in Interplay production you get uh, going through the Black Pearl gateway as well. Um, it's a really robust solution and we think it can be disruptive in the marketplace. We're seeing an incredible need among our customers to be able to reuse assets over and over again. Um, and they, they can't foresee when. Uh, syndication deals come and go, and you might need to repackage a show. You might need to repackage it for the web. You might need to repackage it for, for broadcast or foreign distribution. You need to be able to pull that off the shelf and get those production elements back up and online and workable in a very fast turnaround situation. And that's where Black Pearl really comes in. It's an elegant, simple solution. A uh, customer just buys Black Pearl, a tape library, and they are ready to go. It will hook right up to their Interplay archive. We're okay. Uh, Arctic Blue, let's, let's wrap it really all up. Um, how does it fit? What are all the pieces? Cost-effective nearline storage using power down SMR SATA drives, going for a seven-year product life here. Um, enables your own private cloud. And th this is a big deal, um, making that simple, making it cost effective, uh, making it readily accessible. So the longevity and cost of tape uh, with online performance and accessibility of disk. And as part of the Black Pearl ecosystem, we get all those other benefits. It makes tape work better. It makes uh, tape have an appearance of more ready access, which is really exciting. And then an advanced backup management capability that wraps it all together, says I can have multiple copies. I can move my data wherever I want it for free, and I can handle it all automatically based on uh, policies, based on how long do I need it on each layer. So we're very excited about this, and the rest of the day you're going to be hearing from customers, from partners, and we're going to actually do the hands-on lab. We're in the back. Uh, we'll give you the ability to actually pull one apart, look at it, pull drives out, um, look at the, you know, how is it set up. So I would uh, please, if you can, make sure you come to the, uh, the, the hands-on lab. It'll be very exciting. Thank you for your time, and I think we're going to take a 15-minute break.